Actually, I took a film class at one point in my life. It's one of my favorite classes. And we studied this movie called I Am Legend. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, I really enjoyed this movie because we studied it deeply. We began watching this movie and we began, began seeing these symbols that the directors and the film producers put within the film to give us these glimmers of hope throughout. So th this movie's dark. It's about zombies. It's about this guy's like the last guy alive. It's dark. All he has is a dog. It's dark. But you keep seeing these little things like, like butterflies in the background constantly throughout the movie. Or you see in the background an image and it's a billboard and there's a butterfly there. And then at one point there's this glass and it breaks and it breaks in the form of these wings and it looks like a butterfly. And all of this, what it's doing is it's showing this theme of metamorphosis. How, how man is going from being a, a worm to then a butterfly, this transformation that's happening. So it's showing that not only in the main character but also in this hope that the zombies, those who are dead, are going to one day come back to life like a butterfly. It goes into this cocoon like a worm and then becomes beautiful and there's life. So we've been studying Isaiah, and this is the text this morning, Isaiah chapter 12. Go ahead and read with me. It's on your bulletin as well. Isaiah 12, verse 1. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask now that you will teach us what it means. Help us to remember it. Hide it in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, last week... Last week we studied Isaiah 11 and we understood this thing called the prophetic perspective. When Isaiah is given prophecy, it is as if he's looking at this mountain range. But when he's looking at it, he's looking at it from an angle to where he sees just one triangle, right? Just one mountain. But he doesn't have the beautiful blessing of hindsight that lets us now see this ridge line of how it's all playing out throughout time and being fulfilled. But when he's looking at it, he's looking at it and he's seeing the ups, he's seeing the downs, he's seeing the great parts of the promises, and he's saying, seeing the immediate wrath, and he's seeing it perhaps as one here. So prophetic perspective is like a mountain range. You could fill that in. Some of the prophecy takes place in his lifetime and validates his prophetic gift that he in fact is telling the truth. These things are coming true. Other parts will not be fulfilled for 700 years or even perhaps 2,719 years. Maybe they'll be fulfilled this year. This 66 chapter book is filled with darkness and the wrath from God with only glimmers of hope. Last week we learned how the root of Jesse in chapter 11 is also the shoot of Jesse. So there's this root that's, that's it's this, this symbolic language here, this poetic language, is also going to be the shoot which explains how Psalm 110, verse 1 says, and the Lord said to my Lord, a very weird passage in the Bible that Jesus eventually explains and perfectly fulfills. It makes sense and it points to Jesus. So the sermon explained, you can fill this in, how much of the fulfillment of these prophecies in chapter 11 and 12 are of a future hope. That's what we were looking at last week. However, today we're going to focus on the already part, the already part that we get to experience today of the already but not yet of God's kingdom. So in verse 10 and 12, God's people will be signaled by this root, this is what we're seeing in chapter 11, and saved from their bondage and enslavement. And in verse 16, we're still looking at chapter 11 from last week, we looked at the concept of a highway that will be for God's people just as when they left Egypt. So just as when they left Egypt, there's this passage. There's going to be one of those. It's going to be similar to the Exodus. 
This highway theme is throughout the whole book of Isaiah, though. You can actually look at it if you want. You could write this down. Look at Isaiah 35. Look at Isaiah 19 if you're interested on how that also comes up throughout the book. And, and let me tell you, big thing, you want to be on this highway. You do want to be on this highway, okay? The highway leads to paradise of peace rather than experiencing God's anger and his wrath and destruction as a consequence for your sins, So wherever this highway is going to be, you need to be asking, how can I join? What is the signal that's going to be laid out by the roots? What is that going to be? You need to know this. Over one year ago, sorry, actually exactly one year ago, right before the new year, I preached on on Exodus. I I, I taught on Exodus 4. Exodus 4 is right before all of the crazy stuff starts happening in Egypt, before God's people leave Egypt and the bondage and slavery and cross the Red Sea. This passage today is a lot like, actually, instead, Exodus 15, which is after God has already saved his people out of their bondage, they've already crossed the Red Sea, and then they sing this song together, and they're just thanking God for the fact that he has saved them. So now this song is similar to that. They've exited their enslavement, and now there's this song as a response to being saved. Faith is how you can join the highway, is what we were talking about. And in chapter 11 and the rest of the book, that's Jesus Christ. And that similarly is what the people had when they walked through the Red Sea. Imagine this, this Red Sea, giant ocean, right? Walls of water on each side, and the people decide to walk through it? Yeah, they do. Not because they're just super, like, courageous and bold. It's because they have promises of God, and they're trusting in his promises. And therefore, they walk by faith. So, today's text is going to be split up into three points. Verses 1 and 2, that's our our first point. You can fill it in. It's the saving promise. The saving promise. Verse 3 through 4 is the saving power. And then finally, we're going to look at verses 4 through 6. We're going to finish the chapter, chapter 12. It's the saved people. So let's look at verse 1 and 2, the saving promise. Verse 1 helps us understand the way God's promises have always worked in the Bible. Look at, look at verse 1 there. You will say in that day, look at it, it's, on your, it's right there on your outline, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. So let's break this down really quick. Let's look at verse 1. The person who sings this verse understands something, and therefore he's able to sing what he's saying. Okay? This is, this is what he understands about the way the promise works. The person singing, fill it in, is a saved person. They are no longer under God's anger, and wrath. But hold on, before we keep going, why is God angry? What is this wrath about in the first place? Well, when you hear anger, you may be thinking of someone having an immature, unreasonable temper tantrum. That's the way the world likes to paint God for some reason today. It's just something our, our generation likes to do. God is not like that. That's not the way the Bible describes him. God is not like that caricature. Let me ask you, is anger ever justifiable? Like towards ISIS, or racism, or hate, or selfishness and greed, towards sexual abuse that occurs, school shootings? Can we be angry that these things happen, that they keep happening? Can we be angry that this happens? Yeah, we don't want those things to continue to occur and they keep happening. It's not good. So. Where do kids learn to lie? Where does this sin come from that keeps these problems continuously happening throughout the world? Where did we learn to hurt others? I'm confident almost everybody in this room can remember a time when they've hurt someone. Why is it that sometimes we know something is wrong, and even when we know it's wrong, it's like we want to do it more? What's wrong with us? Today, there's not a person here who could run for president with a clean slate. The media will find something wrong with everybody here in this room. I bet. I bet they would. And let me tell you, if the media can do that, I bet that the all-knowing God who has seen all things and knows the intentions of your heart can do the same. He knows that you are not innocent. He knows that you are part of the problem. You need help. 
the sin problem is going to be destroyed, and you are going to suffer for what you've done. You've sinned against God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. That's Romans 3.23 and 6.23. That's what God says. You've sinned. There's a cost. You've fallen short. It leads to death. So let's look at the next part now. You will say in that day, look at right there in the passage, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Those who sing this song, they understand that they have sinned. Sin is against God and God will punish sin. Yet the singer thanks the one who is angry. Now he thanks him. The object of his salvation and his thankfulness is directed to the God who was angry. He thanks him for no longer being angry and for God being the reason why God is not angry. What does this mean? Is there a riddle here? The Bible says that there's a problem with man's sinful heart. He doesn't acknowledge or thank God. And then all of a sudden his nature changes and he responds with thankfulness. So mankind throughout the Bible is described as not acknowledging God. We have a problem. We don't thank him. We look at ourselves, we make ourselves out to be proud of ourselves, and now all of a sudden the nature of this song changes to thankfulness. So what did God do? How does this all make sense? How does justice, God being the God who we're trusting, will one day make people pay for their sins who we dislike? When we think about people like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, we're like, of course God's going to deal with them. I hope he does. And we make them a standard of definitely not going to heaven that's not the standard. The standard is sin. So what is God going to do? He's angry towards sin. He's angry towards the thing that has ruined the world, yet he is righteous. And he's going to judge it. And Isaiah is filled with both lots and lots of wrath and small bits of glimmers. Where is the hope here? You need to be forgiven by God. How can God forgive well, what he does is he actually takes our sin and he puts it on himself. This is the beautiful thing that Jesus did. This is why Christians say, Jesus died for me. That's why we say that, because we realize that the key is found in God himself who suffered and died for us. You need to be forgiven by God so you could be saved from the punishment for your sin. And the way he fulfills his promises is later found even more clearly, you can see this, in Isaiah 53. It very, very clearly points to Jesus Christ, and that's written 700 years before Jesus Christ is born, before God comes into the world. Listen to what it says, Isaiah 53, verse 5. It's right there on your outline. But he was pierced for our transgressions. That's another word for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities, the things we have done wrong, our guilt, our sin. Upon him was laid the chastisement that brought us peace, he took our burden, he took our punishment, and it brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. So those who trust in the work of Christ will not be judged, feel the sin, because the judge was judged for us. Now, friend, don't miss the last part of verse 1. Don't miss it. Look at the last part there, that you might comfort me. Maybe you were hurting during the holidays. Maybe you realize that there truly is a problem in the world. Maybe you've experienced the disappointments in life. Maybe the holidays were hard. Maybe relationships were tough. Perhaps you've seen now why God hates sin. It hurts. It messes up the world. The Bible explains that paradise, the paradise that is to come without sin, is going to be awesome. It's going to be glorious. Glory, glory, glory. That's what we're singing about. Those disappointments, the pain, the offenses will not be a part of God's eternal kingdom. He will bring comfort the comfort that he can give now with forgiveness and restoration of the new earth. This is the promise that we're seeing, this world where there will no longer be any of this. It's going to be awesome. Let it not be a secret if you're a non-Christian here. I don't want it to be a secret. I want you to be converted. Why? Because God wants you to be converted. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-4, through 4, right there. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Friend, you, you can have that. 
You can say all of verse 1 that we just read, and if you understand verse 2, then you can be saved and you can sing verse 1 as well. This can be you today. Verse 2 now. God is my salvation. Look at it. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Verse 2 starts with a statement. Behold, look, God is my salvation. You see it? Check this out. God is my salvation. Everybody, God is my salvation. That's what it starts off. That's, oh, you don't, don't you have to repeat it. That's what he's saying. I'm explaining the text. Hold on, hold on. You guys are getting crazy. Okay, hold on. So he makes a statement. Follow, follow this. He makes a statement, and now he's going to explain it. Isaiah makes the argument as for why. I will trust and will not be afraid. Notice the connection between the clauses. Action, I will trust. Fill that in. There's the action. Action, I will trust. Result, I will not be afraid. Action, fill that in. Result, fill that in. I will not be afraid. The individual who has trust in God alone has no reason to be afraid. You hear that? No reason to be afraid. The person who can sing this song knows that God has promised that forgiveness comes from God in Christ. No reason to be afraid if you have Christ. So here are some of those promises. Look at Romans 10, verse 9. It's right there on your outline. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you hear that promise? You can believe in that promise. It's true. God's not going to change his mind. Pastor Andrew, he quoted this verse just a couple weeks ago. Look at John 3, 16, but don't stop. We're going to read up to verse 18. There's promises here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, right, this is a promise. Just because you learned it when you were a kid or you've heard it a thousand times doesn't mean it's not powerful. His promise is true. He will keep his word. Keep reading here. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Listen to the promise. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. There's two promises there. If you are not a Christian, God promises he will not ignore your sin. He will not forget. You're not going to get there and be like, come on, come on, I'm a good person. No, he's making promises towards you and towards your sin. He's so consistent. He's such a good judge. He's not going to let anybody slide. That would make him bad. Thank goodness that he's such a good judge. And then keep reading. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. God has made these promises. You should know these promises because this is what our faith lies in. You need to know these. God's not going to break them. He will not change his mind. So now, once again, just to reaffirm this doctrine of faith alone that we, we look at every year when we're studying the Reformation, listen to the echo in, the, in this line in verse 2. Look at verse 2. Look at the second part of verse 2. I want you to see it. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. It is not by any means of your deeds. It's not by any means of your power. No, it's an alien righteousness. It's outside of you. It's external to you. That's where the strength comes from. You don't build it up within yourself. It's not yours. It comes from outside. Your strength is not from yourself. So the Bible never says have confidence in yourself. Did you know that? Never says that. Never says have faith in yourself. You know what that is when people say that? Have faith in yourself, have confidence in yourself. That's hate speech. Because the person who has faith in themselves or confidence in themselves will not have the strength to undergo God's wrath and the punishment that they deserve. They don't have it. They need something besides that, and you're giving them the wrong thing. You're giving them something that I guarantee will not work. That's hate speech when you're looking at the eternal perspective. So come humble to the cross. There's no reason you need to think of yourself. Let's clean ourselves up before we come here. I need to fix my life up before I come to Jesus Christ and decide to become a Christian or get baptized or any of those things. You don't need to do that. Come humble. Rely on the strength that comes from God alone. The strength comes from Him. A few months ago, I was walking across the parking lot from the office 
to this building here, and as I'm walking across, I stumbled across a, I stumbled across a box, a box there, and I opened the box, and I found a bunch of these things. You think that's funny because they're old, right? You think that's funny because I'm not going to be able to listen to these, but you don't know that my car is old, so it's a blessing. I could use this. That's right. So I put them in, and you know what I got to listen to? I got to listen to some sermons from a great preacher named Pastor Bill Billingsley. I don't know who brought that box. Thank you if you're in the audience. But one of the things that Pastor Billingsley would say to the person who's finding their strength in themselves or thinking, oh, I'm going to somehow make myself better before I come to God, he would say, that's foolish. This is what he would say. He would say, if you're trying to clean yourself up to get right with God, that is like telling the doctor you'll take the medicine once you get better. Doctor, I'm sick. I can't do it. I need medicine. He gives you the medicine. You say, okay, thank you. Then you wait to get better. That doesn't make sense. This is what you need. You need the power that comes from Jesus Christ. So, strength will not work. You need the strength from God. And our passage this, this morning does not say, be brave, be courageous. The opposite of fear is not those things. The opposite of fear is to trust. So do you struggle with fear? Are you a person that throughout your week you experience fears in all kinds of ways in different forms? Trust in God and his promises. Students and children, if you're here, the Bible doesn't say that you need to fear God if you believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you don't have to be scared of God. Adults, if you struggle with wondering where you will go when you die, if that's you, you think about what's going to happen, how am I going to be judged? Trust in the promises found in the Bible. Trust in Jesus. Rest in him alone for your salvation. There it is. So now, last part of this section, what does it mean for the Lord God to be my song? Why is chapter 12 written as a song? You know, there's people who never sing in public. They think singing is weird. I know that there's, 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 there's a guy at, at this church who I've seen him pick up two cinder blocks in each hand. I've seen him do this. And I'm pretty sure that this guy doesn't go around singing. I'm pretty sure he's embarrassed if he gets caught singing. If someone's found him singing, you know, he, he just wouldn't let that happen. He would probably only sing if he knew his whole family was out of town and the door was locked. That's it. So why is this song, why is this written like this? This is, this is weird, isn't it? To say that the Lord is my song, fill this in, is to say that he is the cause of my strength. In him I find joy and my delight. You see, there's a whole psychology to the way that humans are with singing and with music. You know, our culture understands this well. Whenever we watch a movie and a person falls in love, immediately what starts in the background? Right? Everything changes. They have a song, they have a delight. It's real to us. When people are happy, we find them singing, right? It's just what happens. It's kind of in our nature. The Lord is my song. He is my delight. You can have that delight this morning. One of the most beautiful things is when I look at the passage of, of Exodus 33, verse 15, you can see this dialogue that Moses is having with God. And what Moses basically says is, the Lord is everything. I don't need all the blessings and comforts in this life as long as I have the Lord. I don't, the promised land is nothing if the Lord doesn't come with me because his ultimate delight is not the promised land. It's God. It's his presence. Oh, how beautiful it is to sit with the saints and sing as they are on their deathbeds. How beautiful it is when they sing because their strength and their song and their delight is in the Lord. Amen. Now we look at verse 3 and 4, point number 2, saving power. Saving power. Verse 3 says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day. So now, as a saved person who is believing in the promises of God, like we looked at already, we find this present, active salvation. The people of Israel, they were saved. When they got out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea. Saved. God did it, and now what's going to happen is they're on this journey, and they're going to be walking through a desert, and they're walking through this desert, 
And you know what saves them as they walk through the desert on their journey? God saves them. Presently, actively, the way he saves them is he provides everything they need. He provides wells for them to live. The people of Israel are saved, yes, after they get through the Red Sea, but they continue continue to be saved on their journey. So if you are walking from Egypt to Israel through that crazy long desert in the heat of the day, you better have some wells. You better have some wells. Let's get this straight. God, in fact, saves Christians upon becoming justified, when they become Christians converted, right? God does that. There's a past tense. He saves us. He declares us that way. Righteous. Boom, it happens. We become Christians. Happens. We're saved, right? And in the Bible, there's this term, right, salvation. You could put that in that box on your outline right above the umbrella, That umbrella encompasses, right? Salvation encompasses justification, sanctification, and glorification. So a lot of times in the Bible when it's talking about salvation, it's talking about one of those. Salvation sums up and holds all of those. Our salvation is not just when we were converted. Fill this in. Salvation is still an active present condition of the Christian. We are being saved. That's what the Bible says. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. It's right there. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are, underline that, being saved, it is the power of God. Another one, Romans 13.11, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed, even though we were saved upon believing. Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13 Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That doesn't mean that salvation is based on your works. That's not what it's saying. It means that God is currently working in us, in the Christian's life. It's similar to what the Bible says about warnings. You know, the Bible has warning passages for Christians. But that doesn't mean that you're going to lose your salvation. That's not what it's implying. Instead, what it's saying What it implies is that when God gives a warning, it works. It's effectual. He gives a warning, and it works. It does its job. Christians, listen, they are saved. So whether it's a warning or a well, God's plan of salvation will not fail. Under Here on the outline, you can fill this in. These wells then are a means of God's sustaining grace. That's what these wells are that we're looking at. So upon becoming a Christian, your new life will be sustained by drawing from the wells of salvation that God will use as a part of his sovereign plan in saving you in the present. Listen to how this works in John chapter 4. There's a woman at the well who has tried everything in life. She's trying to find satisfaction. It's not working. She's empty Her life feels that way. She's thirsty physically. She goes to a well physically thirsty, but symbolically Jesus Christ meets her there perfectly because there's a thirst in her soul, and that's what Jesus is going to talk about. So look at John, or you don't have it in front of you. John 14 says, this is what Jesus says to her, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and I don't have to come here to draw water, to draw water. That's what she says. So if you think living, if you think this living water is good, you can have it today. And it wells up to eternal life. The spring wells up just as it's promised to those who are saved, and it wells up to eternal life because the living water that we have is Christ. The whole time it's been Christ. So fill this in. There's two obvious wells that now we're going to look at. There's two. Two obvious wells. We're just going to talk about these two today that God uses as a plan for us. First, we're going to talk about God's word, and then second, we're going to you fill it in, God's word, and second, we're going to talk about the local church. Okay, those are the two we're going to look at. Although there are many others that we may be able to talk about, these are the two obvious ones. God's Word. Isaiah has been a well to me. When I first thought about teaching Isaiah today, 
It was because Pastor Lucas said, I'm going to preach on Isaiah 11. And I said, Isaiah? That's what I said. Ugh. That's literally what came out of me. And then God started to expose something in me. There's a hypocrisy in my heart. You see, you may not know this about me, but there's something that gets me really frustrated with the church. If you want to know how to frustrate me as a Christian, say you love God's word. Say it. You love God's word, not now. And then you know what you do? You don't know how to apply it to your life. You never read it. You never draw from this well. You say things like, oh, it's hard. Some of these passages are difficult. It's confusing. So I'm not going to read it. Oh, but I love the Bible, but it's hard to read. So say something like that to me. Um, now, if you're saying it because you want help, that's different. But here's the kind of things that drives me nuts. Because they're not willing. People sometimes will say those things and they're not willing to dive deep. And what I immediately noticed is that my faith was very small in the passages of Isaiah. I didn't think that Isaiah could be a part of the promises of God that in fact will sustain my faith and grow my faith and help me in life. I didn't know how it applied to my daily life. I didn't know what to do with it. So I was just like all these people that say they love God's Word, and then the second you ask them a question, they don't know where they find any of the concepts that they claim to understand. They have no anchors from the primary source of God's Word. It's just hearsay. That was me. That's not okay. But as I began to read Isaiah, I began to be convicted of sin. And the more I read about all of this wrath that is totally undesirable to read if you're thinking about it, but as I read about it, it did me well. Then later on that week, as I was thinking about things, I realized I don't want to sin because I have God's Word now hidden in my heart as I've read all of these warnings. It's long and, war and there's all these warnings and wrath on purpose. It was a well to me. When God said things like this in Isaiah, don't trust in man or fear man in whom nostrils are mere breath became obvious that I shouldn't fear man and I shouldn't live a life in fear of man. That's ridiculous. I need to fear God instead and trust Him. These things began to make sense. You know, Pastor Andrew, later on that week, he explained it like this is a great way of explaining it. He says, some people, it's like they treat the Bible and their Bible reading like, you know, you're walking through a forest casually and you're just kicking them leaves, looking, hoping like a jewel will come up maybe a diamond, and you treat it like that, and you walk around. But the people that find those diamonds are the people that dig deep. You can do that in Isaiah. You can do that in the Bible. This is a well for your soul. So, I've been blessed by it. You can be blessed by it too. Number two, the local church, another big one. God has blessed us with one another, the people in this room, the local church, those who we're covenanting with, who are Christians, right? That's a blessing to us, having other Christians. And God has given it as a blessing to us and a gift to us, right? But are you around enough to truly draw from this well? Are, are you just a casual attendee? Are you around enough? Are you serving? Are you finding time and specifically making your schedule because you want to be around God's people. Because if you believe it's a gift, practically, you're going to do those things. That's what faith looks like. You're practically going to believe God, not just believe in Him. You're going to believe Him, and what He says is good, you're going to say, that, that, that must be good. You're going to trust that, and your life's going to look different. Are you enough? Are you around enough? Or are you still an unknown among the crowd? Maybe you are known. However, even though you're known, are you approachable? Are you the kind of person that someone can come and have difficult conversations about maybe things you're not doing right? Or do you even ask for advice from those who think biblically? Are you a person who asks advice of people who are thinking biblically because you want biblical advice? Do you simply fill the church in, and by church I mean the people? Do you just fill in God's people and tell them, oh, you know, I'm doing this or that today. Oh, last week I did this or that. That's what's going on in my life. You just fill us in? You just fill in Christians with what's going on? Or do you actively have conversations prayerfully asking for them to give you wise counsel? Is that what your life looks like? Do you ask people to pray with you and speak into the decisions of your life? Or does that seem disrespectful and odd and how dare they? This well of the local church, 
It's a gift. Believe it. Now, the last thing I want to say before we move on to the next point is I want to talk about trials. Trials aren't a well in themselves. In themselves, however, God uses the space in between well A and well B. He uses that space there in the trials within to help us to appreciate these wells. Oh man, I you know I love Christmas. Christmas, the family gets together, and what we do is we just reminisce and remember all these crazy, funny stories of our past, right? And I remember this year the story. My cousin and I we're we're at this park, and the park is shaped in a weird way. It's 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 like a long park, miles long. And the birthday party was here at this end of the park, and my cousin and I wander off walking through this park. We end up all the way on the other side of the park. My cousin looks, he sees a tree, he goes, hey, see that tree right there? That's called Anoncio. I'm like, really? Oh, I'm thirsty, let's go have some Anoncio, whatever that is, right? So I go up to this tree, we both pick at the same time, we're like, okay, let's do it. (laughs) It was as if this tree had like gas in it, because what it did was it pressurized this little fruit, and what immediately happened is upon taking a bite, it squirted into my mouth, And then immediately I knew I was going to (laughs) die. I look at my cousin, and he knew that too. We were both going to die. So we didn't even say anything to one another. We just ran all the way from this side of the park, running. It was so long. I could just remember wanting to stop but thinking I was going to die. We're running, running, running. And then we look. There's There's the party. Oh, look. Oh, there's Dad. He has a cooler for us. Oh, no, Dad. No. There's the cooler, he dumps it out. Our source of life is now on the ground. We run, we finally get to the cooler, we grab the ice, we fill our mouths with ice, because it's all we can do, and wow, how we appreciated water that day. See, sounds, sounds funny. Our trials, though, many times aren't funny like that. They're real. And what those trials do is they're a part of God teaching us to rejoice and to delight ultimately in Him and to experience these wells and then therefore say, just like Isaiah is teaching us, to give thanks. Helps us to appreciate, does it not? So now let's look at verse 3 through 6. Number 3, a saved people. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing praises to the Lord for he has done gloriously, let this be made known in all the earth. Verse 6, shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. This next section will highlight how, uh, you could fill this in, how being saved makes you a part of a saved community. The first half of this, you can't see it in, in the English text, but in the Hebrew you would be able to notice that the first half of this song is written all with the individual. All the yous that you see there are individuals, you, you, you. But then it transitions after verse 3 to, and y'all will say in that day. But for some reason Bible translators don't like putting y'all in there, but, but it's in your notes, so you could put that in there, y'all. First half is individual, that's what makes you a part of the community, your individual salvation, not grandmas, not grandpas, not dad or mom, that's not what makes you a Christian. It's if God's anger has been turned away from you because you are trusting in Jesus Christ. Now if you have that, immediately, Isaiah doesn't explain anything about how it happens, but it's assumed, it's implied. Now you're part of God's saved community. It's an immediate transition. So you're expected to be a part of this saved community, doing what this song says if you're saved. And what the song now does is the last bit of it is all commands. Look at it. They're all commands there at the bottom there. They're commands. They're what we call imperatives, like an emperor saying, do this. He's giving commands. Sing. Praise. Tell. Right? And so the song does that. But notice how those come after it's assumed that the people are saved. The commands of God do not save you upon you looking at what to do right and wrong, and then God says, oh, he's such a good boy, I'm going to let him into heaven. No. If you become a Christian, if the strength that you have is found in Jesus Christ alone, what he did on the cross, he gives you his righteousness, and now that you have that, he teaches you how to live. He gives you his nature and his law and his commands, and you can understand him better through that. So, does the same thing in Exodus. 
saves the people out of Egypt, right? Takes them through the Red Sea, and then he gives them the law. So let's study the saved community of Isaiah chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, okay? The saved community is empowered by God's grace. And the connection between the clauses, once again, it's key. You have to see this. You can fill that in. It's key, the connection between these clauses. Verse 3 says, look at it, you will draw water. That's what verse 3 says. You will draw water, and then verse 4 says, and you will say. You see that? Action, result. Action, you will draw water. Result, you will say. You see that? Verse 4, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. What makes Christians thankful? What does that? Wells of salvation. Look with me at verse 3 and 4. You draw water and you say, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. We become thankful upon our drawing from the wells of salvation. Do you need to be more thankful? You can ask your family members right after Christmas, right? Draw from the wells of salvation. Verse 4, make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. What makes Christians evangelize? What, what does that? Drawing from the wells of salvation. Do you need to evangelize more? Do you need to tell more people who you love or people that you know at work or in your life or in your family about Jesus? Do you sometimes feel guilty in church? Of course you do. You always feel guilty in church when it comes to evangelism. Nobody does this well, right? The standard, the standard we could always evangelize more. Do you need to do that more? Draw from the wells of salvation, and then you will make known his deeds among the peoples and proclaim that his name is exalted. These are verses about telling about God. The power of grace to work in you as you evangelize is in the wells of salvation. In my life, I've noticed the trend. The more I've read the Bible in my life, the more I find myself talking about God, telling others about him. It's a real trend, it's what happens. So believe this promise. Verse five, sing praises to the Lord. Look at that. Sing praises to the Lord for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. What makes Christians praise God and talk about what he has done? What makes that happen? It is that they are saved people who are experiencing God's grace actively by drawing from the wells of salvation. Verse six, Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. What makes God's people sing? What makes you sing this morning? What makes them sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs like Ephesians 5 explains that the church is commanded to do? What makes them do this? That great in their midst is the Holy One of Israel. They they have that spring of water that is welling up to eternal life within. Jesus Christ has promised to be with us until the end of the age. That's what makes us sing. Salvation makes us sing. The holy seed of Isaiah, Pastor Ben, he read earlier the passage in Isaiah 6. That holy seed of Isaiah that's later found in our scripture reading that we read earlier that holy seed is the root and the stump. It is Christ. It is Jesus. So because we have Christ, we have reason to sing. He is our reason to sing. He is in our midst. The whole earth, right? Holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. We have reason to sing. So our congregational singing, it comes from drawing deep from the wells of salvation. Do you see the connection? You will draw water and you will give thanks. Evangelize, proclaim the excellencies of who God is. Sing praises for what he has done. You'll care more about world missions. You'll care more about the Lottie Moon offering if you draw deeply from the wells of salvation. You will draw water and you will be filled with joy because of the reality of the relationship with God to the point of shouting for joy. I know this all sounds weird, especially if you're non-Christian. If you're non-Christian, you're hearing this about shouting for joy and singing and stuff, this all sounds weird. But 
But this is what it might be like. It might be like you're walking into the room of a sibling and you catch them singing and they see you and they're like, oh. It might be like that, but the difference is, rather than the sibling slamming the door on your face saying, why'd you open the door? Because they're embarrassed that you caught them singing. That's not our response as, as a church. Our response is, you know why we're singing? There's something awesome. And you can have that too. You can have Christ too. And we want you to have that. We don't shut the door in your face. We say, have this. Truly is the water that takes away thirst. Truly is a well of salvation. So if you're not trusting in Christ, even though your life may feel perfect and you're just coming here because you had to because of a friend or family member, if you're not trusting in Christ, God's anger and wrath is still real. It's reality. Don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts towards these promises of God's wrath and also of his comfort that you can have and experience. You can believe in Jesus and you could be forgiven of all. There's no need to perish when Jesus Christ came into the world to save. So today's the day of salvation. So I want to conclude with this. What happens? What happens when we don't draw from these wells? Or what happens when our wells dry up? What happens when they dry up? You could fill that in. What happens when local churches no longer draw from the living water? What would happen to us? What happens when the New Year's saving plan is not concerned with saving lives for eternity? What happens when churches are more interested and people are more interested in a healthy habit of exercise than drawing from the wells of salvation? What happens when the best New Year's low-carb diet that you've been on for years is avoiding the bread of life? What happens to marriages when they're filled, similar to the, the book of Isaiah, how the outside influences, the influences of lies? It's not the truth that the other nations are bringing in and God's people begin to believe them. What happens? What happens when marriages are like that? When we get filled with outside influences all day long, how marriage is supposed to make you happy. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, your spouse should be more like this. They should do more things like that. And those worldly expectations, they breed in your mind and you come up with worldly solutions to your problem rather than giving thanks. Those deserts cannot be walked through without wells of salvation. You will not be able. What happens when after celebrating the holidays, you realize many of your family members are unsaved and others who claim Christ are living in open sin, and you hear it in their conversations. Draw deep, brother, sister, grandma, grandpa, moms and dads, draw deep. For the power to preach the gospel to those you love does not come from yourself. It comes from the strength found in God. Draw from the waters, and then you will say you need that in order to tell, to tell the good news to your family if you love them. What happens when thousands of churches in the U.S. who once sent out missionaries are now closing their doors? It's happening all over the place, especially in the southern part of the United States, right? It's happening. What happens when they don't draw from those wells? Thousands will perish. We need to be a church that is filled with the gospel, that is filled with the understanding of where salvation comes from, and it needs to be our well of life. How will they hear that God's anger can be turned to comfort if no one goes and tells them? Sheridan Hills, let's close on this. Here is our New Year's resolution. Let's draw deep, you could fill it in, from the wells of salvation this year. Let's pray.